<laughs> All right. Hello. And uh, good morning. Um, I just came back from uh, from Ohio, uh, where something uh, and America, where something quite extraordinary is uh, taking place. Uh, Barack Obama is uh, in the lead, and uh, people I'm meeting now is saying that he's uh, going to win with a shocking uh, victory, uh, a landslide, uh, a remarkable victory, a substantial victory. Uh, it will be a victory for Barack Obama. That's what people say right now, and that is, uh, of course, amazing in so many ways. One of the most interesting things about it is that it wouldn't have happened without uh, new media and social uh, media. Uh, and uh, he has been using new technology to mobilize voters, uh, to fundraise, and to spread his message in a way that nobody else uh, had been doing before, and he couldn't, couldn't have won without it. Therefore, we have invited, uh, and it's really a great pleasure, Peter Leiden, who is, I think, uh, uh, the best guy on this, uh, the, on this uh, subject uh, in the States, the leading expert in politics and new media. He was uh, the director of the Think Tank New Politics Institute. Uh, he was previously managing editor at Wired, director of Global Business Network's pioneering think tank, He's also worked as a journalist, of course, a special correspondent for Newsweek in Asia, and he's been co-authoring two books, The Long Boom and What's Next. But right now, as I said, he is the leading expert of the most exciting political media phenomena uh, in the world, how Barack Obama is changing politics these months. Welcome, Peter Leiden. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we have the the slides here. Thanks. It's great to be in Europe. Uh, it's great talking about the election. It seems like there's a huge, obviously a huge buzz right now about what's going on in the States, what's going to happen to get beyond the Bush years. I know there's caused a lot of consternation here in Europe. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in Obama himself, like African-American, son of an immigrant, uh, becoming president. But I'm going to really talk to you, what I call about the Bo Obama moment, is really, it's bigger than all that. We're really in an extraordinary moment in American history, and it is really more like on a handful of times in American history we've seen this kind of change in politics. And I'm going to make the case for you now. I'm also going to talk about how central technology and new media has been to this, but also is going to be into governing coming up here. And we're going to cover a lot of ground today, but I want to basically uh, try to get across this full kind of complex argument here. Now, Barack himself has been constantly talking about, America, this is our moment. It's an historic moment. It's different. It's, big. it's not just another cycle. It's not even just getting past one administration of eight years. There's something bigger going on. And in fact, he's absolutely right. He has his own way of describing this. But the way I would describe this is there has been literally a handful of times in American history where we watched an explosion of political and social innovation that takes about 10 to 20 years that we completely revamp, reinvent, essentially, America at some level, at some fundamental level, to deal with very basic challenges and fundamental restructuring of our country. It happened in the early 19th century, right after the Revolutionary War kind of period. It happened with Thomas Jefferson, the founding of the Democratic Party. It happened around the Civil War with the founding, essentially, of the Republican Party and Abraham Lincoln. Again, another a run of a couple decades there of incredible innovation. It happened at the beginning of the 20th century, for about 20 years, what we call our progressive era, our classic progressive era. And it happened with the Great New Deal, the Great Depression, and, and the rise of Hitler in World War II. We're in that kind of moment now, I would argue here. Now, what happens in these moments, essentially, is two things. They either come from the response to deep structural change in the economy and society, or they actually come from unprecedented challenges that the country has never been able to face before. And the old politics is completely inadequate to deal with it, and so there has to be, at some level, some kind of response from politics. The thing that happens in terms of solving these things, in every one of these periods, three things has come together, which is, in fact, happening today. One, there's almost always a new technology and a new media transformation, something, a new tool that basically people can take 
and leverage to new ends that they couldn't do before. The second thing that happens is there's always some kind of massive population change that restructures the politics in a fundamental way. And the third thing is we basically have a, um, oops, we have essentially a wave of new ideas about how to deal with that era's challenges. Now this has happened, I'm going to go quickly here to give you a sense of how this happened. It happened when essentially the country went from an agricultural economy to an industrial economy or from rural living to urban living and that happened in the late 19th century into the early 20th century. And so what we had then was what we call our, our classic progressive era in the United States uh, history books. It happened for about 20 years here. Now what happened then, just again this is kind of interesting new media thing, what happened then was that was the rise of the great new uh, newspaper empires. Essentially we were able to mass produce newspapers in a way that we couldn't do before. So this is the first real mass media, that was a big tool. It also brought women into, women hadn't voted up until that time, they got the vote in that period. Immigrants from Europe essentially drove the changes there and ultimately we had a wave of new ideas of how to actually democratize and humanize the economy. And again, if we had more time, we can go into more things here. But from American history point of view, we broke up the great robber barons. We established a progressive income tax. Uh, women got to vote, unionized workers, child labor ended. All these different things that at the time were seen as very big advances into the restructuring of American uh, economy and society. The second time it happened in, in, our, in a kind of this century was in the middle of the century. And that was in the rising into the great challenges of the Great Depression, the rise of fascism, communism. Again, things that the old politics, the old laissez-faire conservative politics just didn't know how to deal with in the 20s there. And so in fact, they had the same thing there. In this case, they had broadcast radio, the beginning of broadcast electronic media. They had essentially a new configuration of uh, politics, which we could go into more detail another time, and ultimately had a bunch of new ideas of how to deal with this. And so what happened in that period is you watched in literally 15 years, you watched a new way to intervene government into the economy, you watched a new way to defend and contain kind of against uh, nuclear war even by the end of that. Along with Europeans, we built the United Nations, World Bank, IMF, completely new institutions to deal with the new global economy or the uh, international economy at that time, and ultimately an explosion of innovation in 15 years. Again, we're in one of those moments now. This is really the kind of level I think we're watching a change in politics right now. And I think this is why Obama has been able to tap into that kind of energy in the country. What's happening now? Fundamental restructuring, as we all know, about computer and internet technologies. It is fundamentally changing the groundwork of how essentially our entire economy and society works. The biggest story, as we know in this age here, is the restructuring of everything into this global frame, the globalization of everything. People in 50, 100, 500 years from now, they'll look back on the early 20th first century and say, that's when the world went global. That's how fundamental the structuring is going on in the economy. And we're seeing a wave of new challenges in the 21st century that are completely unprecedented, not the least of which is uh, global warming. But there are all kinds of them. I mentioned here, if you see on here, every one of these new challenges is a huge complex problem that any era would have a really difficult time trying to figure out. We've got to do them all simultaneously in about the next 10, 20, or 50 years at the very least. What is happening on the solution side, though, is we're basically coming together these same three things. As I mentioned, the biggest media technology transformation the world has ever seen, bar none, in terms of its scope and its, uh, the speed of its happening. Of course, it's happening with the internet and computers. The second thing in America, which I'm going to go over here, which you might not be aware of, we are going through a fundamental restructuring of our population right now. Very fundamental change, as fundamental as it was in the early 20th century with the immigration from Europe. Very, very huge change going on there. And ultimately, there's a whole new wave of ideas of how to deal with sustainability, climate change, new energy that essentially is starting to go. Now, this is a media thing. Uh, and I, you know, I, so most people here know a lot about media. But I want you to just throw some statistics up about that, how big a deal it is, just from the American perspective. And I think I'll go very fast here. But I did want to just show the kind of couple of American numbers to compromise or to kind of show you here how quickly it's changing in the United States. The peak of newspaper circulation was 1984, the arrival of the Mac, uh, Macintosh, frankly. And what's happened is they've lost 45% of their circulation in the last, uh, up until that time. Now, any business that loses that kind of uh, business is going to be traumatized. And every single newspaper in the United States is fundamentally shaken right now. It's not at all clear where it's going to go. The same thing with broadcast and uh, the, the, the same media that I mentioned happened in the middle of the century. Look at the numbers here for the fall of broadcast audience, actually here. Broadcast audience from the mid-80s has gone no place but down. Now some of that was taken from cable audience to picking it up. 
But what is really happening here is this is the penetration of the digital video recorders, TiVos, or I don't know what you actually call them here, but essentially uh, they're the ones that you can basically skip all commercials. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening. This was a Nielsen rating uh, story that was considered positive that was, hey, 40% of people with these are still watching commercials or advertisements, but of course 60% don't. We're watching a fun, and again, $60 billion goes every year into television ads in the United States. And pretty quickly, that's going to have to find a place. Where is that going to go? Now, the new media stuff, again, I'm going to go fast here because I want to get to the politics of it. But again, just the numbers out of nowhere. Just remember, four years ago, YouTube did not exist. And here, within the first year, it was hitting 100 million video streams a day. It's rumored to be about 200 million video streams a day. They're not saying for sure, but it's basically different ways to kind of calculate that. Phones, we're now seeing basically 30% of all people with phones in the United States don't have landlines. They only have mobile phones. That's probably higher here in Europe. I don't even know how that works. But basically, it's starting to fundamentally shift now to mobile phones. Mobile in the United States is a gateway to minorities. If you look at these numbers here, and I'm going fast, but if you look at the numbers here, very high penetration, more high use actually with African Americans and Hispanics than the white population. So it's very much a way into media, uh, into uh, the minority groups. And ultimately, whoop, of course, we got the Facebook MySpace numbers. And in fact, this was just from the summer. It's now, you know, I think actually Facebook is now pumped up again. But again, huge numbers. You get that part. I just want to kind of just say the numbers for the states are really starting to bite as well. Now, American population, you might not know as much about this one, but the millennial generation is young people in their 20s and teens. It is the biggest generation in American history, bar none, bigger than the baby boom. And if you look here at essentially an age pyramid, this is a classic way demographers talk about population. This is extended to 2015, which is essentially what the American population will be in 2015 with again old people at the top and young people there and then men and women this is the baby boom that everyone's worried about and there was a baby there's a baby boom in europe that's doing the same thing which is essentially not dying off fast enough and so they're stressing all the social systems that we're all worried about but what people are not seeing is in america and i'm not sure exactly how that works in the united States, here in europe but it's a bigger generation it's their children but it's also immigrants there are two things combined there that are actually lifting the numbers up in the united states why is this important? Because this generation is essentially trending very progressive and very democratic. In 2000, with Kerry here, if it was just young people voting, it would have been a landslide for Kerry. This is essentially uh, the numbers here for the 2006 congressional elections. They voted overwhelmingly for Democrats. And I'm going to show you in a minute what is happening today. And of course, they're using these new technologies. The one people here might not be as aware of, and I want to just say here, is Hispanics. And this is, again, because of new media, it's a very important way to think about this. One is, by 2050, almost 30%, 29% of all Americans will be Hispanic. This is a very huge shift, and it's very fundamental. It's causing a lot of kind of angst, essentially, in American population. Not as much as immigration here, but it's still very interesting. Because if you look here, the trend lines, this is essentially the minority population in the United States up until today. This is the white population as a percentage. This is today. But look at the projections very conservatively are by 2050, there will essentially be a majority of the country will be minority. Again, why is this important? This is essentially why a guy like Obama is not that bizarre in the United States. Because Americans are essentially living this kind of mixed race kind of uh, polyglot culture and ahead of the game here, ahead of what Europe's actually seeing. Right now, essentially, too, this is a snapshot right now in the United States. All those border states, California and Texas, over a third of the populations are Hispanic. Again, something, and even into the heartland, you can see here from the map, it's starting to get very, very serious percentages of uh, Hispanics. Why is that important? Well, the same thing's happening here. This is a shift in the Hispanic vote towards the Democrats from 2004, when Je Bush did pretty well, to essentially 2006, where it started to actually, this is the congressional race there. Now, I'm going to move here quickly to this paradigm shift, uh, today's political paradigm shift, because this is the tech thing that I think we wanted to, I want to focus on. What, so the beginning piece of this shift is essentially the shift in technology to, of politics that's catalyzing and pulling this whole thing together. 
Now, how did politics work before? It worked in the United States for three ways it worked. It basically works the same in Europe from the beginning of broadcast television. If you basically were able to amass a lot of money, you had to go to wealthy people or corporations, basically, or big unions to basically get enough money. That was how it was worked. You had to, for organization, you had to have the party establishment under your belt. You had to have them there. And ultimately, for media, you had to master 30-second advertisements and TV. If you did this best, you always won. Always won. No way around it. Until now. And what's happened is a new model was cracked by Howard Dean in the last cycle was the first one to use the internet in a new way. Wasn't mature enough to make it all the way to win, but he actually started to crack the model. And what's happened now is in fact that model is this. This is the model, by the way, that uh, Obama takes. One is for fundraising. You don't have to go to the big fat tax. You can actually tap into many, many, many middle class people and aggregate much bigger sums. Two, you don't need the party. You can go outside the party. You can organize people, particularly with uh, computer te uh, internet technologies. And three, you have to play the game of TV, but you actually really get strategic advantage through the web. And all three of these is what Brock did. He took it to a much higher level than Dean ever did. And it is the only reason, basically Martin mentioned it, it is the only reason he was able to beat Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton had all the traditional advantages. She ran the best campaign on the old model that any Democrat has ever done. And she lost. And she lost because of this new model upset her. And it was a Brock who was able to do that. Now, from a Republican point of view, I'm not being partisan here, but the Republicans are a whole cycle behind. John McCain is completely in the old model. They do not understand the new model. And in fact, if you watch close enough in the United States, the one person, the Howard Dean of the Republicans, was a guy named Ron Paul. And he, was, he wasn't able to win, but he basically used the new model very effectively. So it'll take another four years for them to come up. Now, how does this political paradigm shift work? How does it work? I'm going to show you some numbers here. The first one, again, is in fundraising, from a few wealthy people to the many, many, many people pitching in a little bit of money. Look at the numbers here. This is essentially the last campaign. If you can see the numbers here, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, the colors there. The first quarter of 2007, last year is when the campaign started, Hillary and uh, Barack were bought neck and neck. Same for the next quarter, quarter being three, three month cycles here, right? So the first quarter even, second quarter even, third quarter even, fourth quarter roughly even, it's still pretty even. And then came the first, the real first primaries. And then what happened in January? Boom. You see Barack taken off. Then you see the second month, February, boom, Barack taken off. And then you see even the third month right there. Those are months, not quarters. So if you combine those three months, the quarter would be through the roof right now. Now, the only way you could do that was with internet technologies to scale up. The only way. You could not have done it the old way. The other thing, just to show you how the old school, all the Republican money used in the old kind of way methods were essentially was beat by all, this is for every race up until through the primaries, the Democrats clearly are much ahead because they're much more ahead in these uh, fundraising techniques. And so it's giving them big strategic advantage. Now, why is this important? Because technology can scale. So in the old days, if you could basically get about 100,000 rich people or corporations to throw in, you could make enough money to run for president. Then, essentially, Barack Obama, in the primaries, our kind of preseason, essentially, to get the nomination, he had 1.5 contributors who could just throw in a little bit, and that's even more money. He raised more money. But the thing is, for the general election here, it's very conceivable he might get as high as, uh, it's not clear yet exactly, but you could have many, many more contributors until you can really blow away the numbers here. And ultimately, you can start to see, once you scale this, who knows what the, sky, the sky's the limit? Who knows how many people in the United States will basically get in future kind of cycles here where it starts to really get serious. Organizing, I'm gonna do this quickly here too. Just give you the facts so you can see that this is not just me talking about this. Democratic turnout. Now, yeah, it's been an exciting race and stuff, but I'm telling you, 2004 was an exciting race, too. People really were frustrated on the Democratic side with Bush. But look at the turnout numbers here, basically. The Democrats from 2004 to 2008 had a, more than doubled the number of people came out. And in fact, they almost more than doubled the Republican turnout. Now, why is that? Yeah, excitement, various things. The tools. The tools were allowing us to get out a vote in a much, much more uh, a different way. One of the good insights in this, why is it tool-oriented? Look at young people. 
Young people who do use these tools more than anybody, they almost tripled their turnout in some of these states. These are all state by state, just showing you again, the light blue from 2004, the dark blue for 2000, uh, this, this cycle, basically. This is the share of the vote. This might be getting too deep in there because we don't have enough time. But essentially, this is a percentage of all voters. The young people essentially took a larger share of all voters in every one of these states. Again, these are the kids that are essentially tapping into these new tools. And they're basically able to take a larger share from old people, a larger share from uh, more of the traditional constituencies. Again, almost a half, half again increase in their share. And this is essentially Hispanic turnout. Record turnout. This is, again, these things are, they actually go much higher here for California and Texas. But again, over the 2004, huge increases. Again, overwhelmingly to Democrats, if you look at these compared to the Republicans. Tools. It's new tools. That's really, I would say, now, it's other things too, so I don't want to say it's only that. But what's about the tools is politics is always about social networking. It's always been about getting friends and families to the polls. Now you just do it with essentially the new technologies, essentially supercharges it. My Barack Obama account, com, which we have time, we might chat a little bit about that. It's incredible what they're being able to do there, how average citizens can kind of tap into this and actually move into the politics. So what's happened in the United States in the space of literally just about a cycle or so is we've gone from a very small centralized paid staff to essentially a situation where you are going to have essentially by uh, the election date uh, this fall, basically, you're going to basically have, you know, probably... I don't know, 2 million people who will be waking up every day for the next month here and actually thinking they're working for the campaign even though they are not paid a dime. Uh, but, but they're able to do this because they, they can tap in through these technologies. Now, the third thing is in media, and it's actually playing out in politics. And again, we could talk a lot about this, but here's just an example of how in the first quarter, actually this is up, uh, yeah, this is for the first quarter of the primary of this year, Look at the difference between Barack Obama's YouTube views and Hillary, and for that matter, John McCain's, who's barely, barely even in the game here. Um, very, very significant. Now, these have just continued to go up all, fall, all summer here, too, so I could update this. The point is, this started to give strategic advantage, because they still are all playing TV. They have to play that game. But this was actually able to, like, pop it higher. And again, look at the average length, the average number of views for the top, this is just Obama's top 10. Uh, Average length, 13 minutes, 13 minutes, not 30 seconds, 13 minutes. Huge difference of what, what's going on. You're able to really, really stay with people in this space. Now, people say, well, eyeball gap. Well, yeah, but TV still reaches more people. True, but look at what's happening here. Everybody looking at that video is actively wants to be doing it as opposed to not, want, not giving a rip in television. You can go as long as you want beyond 30 seconds. I mean, 30 seconds, what can you learn in 30 seconds? You can barely learn anything. You can barely get moved. If you spend 13 minutes, you're going to get connected to somebody, which is what's happening. You're immediately linked to fundraising. If you watch a television commercial and you want to give money, you don't even know how to do it. Do I phone someone? Do I look on the web? I don't know where to go. With this stuff, you just push the button next to it, put your credit card in, boom, you raise money. That's what's happening. Anyhow, very easy to get involved, goes through your personal networks, all the viral things we know about it. And so what's happened is, and this is everything, whatever he knows, without question, the most remarkable advertisements of this cycle in America have been essentially free, made by supporters. Uh, you know, you can see some of these. The Will I Am, Yes We Can thing, for those that know it, the Hillary 1984 ad. I mean, all these are the great ads, essentially, that was happening. And ultimately, the great thing about it is you didn't have to buy it. You didn't have to place it. You didn't have to pay for anything to get them seen, not just locally, nationally, but globally, because a lot of you people were able to watch it too. An incredible, this is a paradigm shift. When you get a paradigm shift, that's when it really upsets everything. So what I'm saying to sum up, we're shifting in front of our eyes here, this cycle, from a paradigm where you really essentially are shifting from control of a wealthy kind of fundraising to actually tapping into many. We're actually seeing the shift from um, having to control the party to essentially being able to go outside the party and ultimately just having to do TV to now doing the web. Now, where I'm going to shift here, because we're going to cover a, well, the final little thing here is the bigger move is top down, bottom up. And right now, I think this is where we're at. I think with Obama here, we're starting to see how bottom up is actually starting to be top down. The old way of politics was very, very top down, very controlled. This new thing is out of control, but it's winning. 
Now, what do we do now? This is where I'm just going to shift to what's going to happen, I would say, post-election. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. You can never be too sure in politics. But I would say, I would, as, as Martin mentioned, it's starting to break very clearly here. And I've been saying for a long time, you're, it's going to be very hard to stop this new politics with the old traditional politics, which is what uh, McCain is trying to do right now. Uh, and so I think it's going to be a substantial win. We'll see. Hard to predict. Crazy stuff happens. But anyhow, if it does happen like this, um, what are we going to do? What, not just America, but what is the world going to do about global warming? The most complicated problem humans have ever faced is changing the climate. We've changed the climate. Now we've got to stop changing it. Terrorism. Haven't figured it out yet. We've spent a lot of money, a lot of time in kind of crazy ways all over the world trying to figure this out. Hasn't figured it out yet. It's got, we've got to find a more secure way to live in the 21st century. And the globalizationist economy is tearing the fabric of a lot of societies up, including in Europe. These are fundamental system change things that our politics in the West, our politics globally, but also in politics in the United States have to address. How did they do it before? It's a good instruction just to think back. At the time that FDR, uh, Roosevelt, came into power in 1932 in a landslide victory off a conservative that was seen to be failing, like Hoover, very similar, I would say, to what's seeming to happen with Bush and the kind of craziness going on with the, kind of the, 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 the financial markets even. It just, it's, it's almost like taking a script right out of the book here. Um, what did they do? Roosevelt had no idea what to do, basically. The New Deal that we look back on as the Great New Deal was a slogan. It, would have been it had been basically cribbed, just taken from a journalist, frankly, in uh, the campaign. They had no idea. The day he was inaugurated, he shut down the banking system for 10 days as a holiday and said, get everybody who knows anything about banking in a room and come out the other end with an idea. And that's what they did. But what they had was an entrepreneurial attitude, innovative attitude, and they trial and error. And what they basically did is did what they could do with the tools of their time. And essentially, in this space, you know, their technologies was take a bunch of white guys, it wasn't even women, and put them in with chalk in a room, which is the chalk in the hair. This is kind of like the, the way you could solve problems. Now, I say this because we're going to have, we have a lot different deal. Now, in 15 years, they went from that crazy time, less than 15 years, to essentially the system that to this day we are living in. IMF, World Bank, all the stuff we know, Bretton Woods Accord, all that stuff, it's essentially the same system we're building on. Not just Americans, but uh, obviously with a lot of European uh, help, it too. It wasn't just the FDR and American thing, but it was a huge thing. Now, why is that important? Because we have incredible resources. With the computer power and the internet power, it is just an insane, essentially, tools, essentially, compared to what those folks had back there, to deal with, granted, very complex deals. And so I want to just say, watch for the paradigm shift after the election in terms of policymaking and governing. Because I think we're going to see a very similar thing happening to what we saw in politics, electoral politics. One is if you take the old model of how things work in Washington, or I would imagine in uh, Brussels or however else you think about uh, the policymaking apparatus here in Europe or, or your own country. Um, essentially, the old model has a several very similar kind of factors, essentially. Oops, how are we doing here? One is essentially, it's all funded by wealthy special interests. Corporations run, you know, basically put the money behind, you know, the, the energy policy is all funded by ExxonMobil and folks like that. So you're not going to get the greatest, uh, or, or crazy rich people. Uh, those are the two things. Two, it's all done by insiders who go in and out of government and into these policy think tanks. And ultimately, it's not using new, new media at all anyway. Uh, it's basically just doing the old model. So what can we start to do here? We could start to, one, get different kinds of funding, but also what we could start to do is, through technology, tap into a much larger network of people who understand these problems and start to leverage these new media and these new technologies. And just to kind of give you, remind you, the beauty of technology is its ability to scale. Right now, you can only get maybe 100 in Washington time terms fellows in an institute to kind of figure out how to do climate change. We need to basically get 10,000 people figuring this out. Luckily, through technology, you can do that. The second thing about technology, as we know, is parallel processing. You take, like a server farm, you take a big problem, you break it into small problems, figure it out, and aggregate it up. 
Well, that's what we have to basically do with essentially all these problems, essentially I mentioned to you. We already went over them. Well, every one of those has to have a solution. We basically got to take every one of those issues, and even within every one of those issues, we have to take just clean energy, for example. Getting our electricity grids to 100% renewable is going to take incredible work in policy and true innovation in the economy in all these different areas. How do you store it? How do you use solar? How much wind? All this stuff. You're doing a lot with wind here, which is fantastic. We just, but we got to do a lot more. And the third thing about internet technologies is it collapses space. And that is something we've got to start doing. Is it's not, in the United States, I do this talk in the United States, so I, I'll, I'll, there's a global dimension is too. But essentially, we have to tap into people all over the country, in our country, to basically move ideas in. And ultimately, we have to tap into people all over the world. In this case, my identification here in this, in this thing is I actually do, I'm working with some folks on a, nec, a concept for a next generation think tank called Next Agenda. It's a project I'd love to talk to anyone afterwards. But I'm going to end basically here. I started with Obama saying this is our moment. America is our moment. It's really the world this is our moment. There is something very fundamental, very big going on here. It's not just about Obama. Obama is just a, as much a symbol of it as he is a kind of catalyst of it. He's an extraordinary person, don't get me wrong. But it's not happening because of him. He is, ha he is essentially a, a clear catalyst, but it's not all about him. He constantly uses a phrase uh, that actually is from a progressive uh, activist earlier in the 20th century, saying, we are the ones we've been waiting for. You know, people, somebody else isn't going to figure out climate change. Our children aren't going to basically figure out how to deal with terrorism. We have to figure it out. Our era is time. This constellation of generations coming together on the planet today. And if we think about it for one last sense of inspiration, back in the, t this is a chart of college educated people in the United States from 1940, even though it says 1950, the beginning is 1940 here. Less than 5% of the population had a college education. Today, as you see from that chart, it's gone up all the way to 30%. In real terms, actually, we used to have only 5.6 million people with college educations. Now we've got 86 million, just as a one example of human capital. But here's the thing for the people here can really appreciate. If you would have told Franklin Roosevelt or Churchill or all the comparable people in Europe that we're going to give you a machine you can put in not just your desk but on your hand, and you can ask any question in the world and get back all the world's related information within a second, they would have said that's magic. And we just call it Google. And uh, every five-year-old in America knows how to use it, right? Extraordinary resources we have to solve this stuff, which, in fact, we'd have to do. So we are completely capable in America, in, this, in the world, to make the transition to these new technologies, to basically make the transition to this global society, to figure out this kind of new, you could say, sustainable formula to transition to clean energies off of uh, carbon-based energies, which is a huge thing, to figure out a way to live together in a much more kind of safe but a secure and long-standing sustainable way. We're totally able to do it, but it's basically got to start with everybody here in the audience and with all of us, I guess, together. And if you don't think we're going to be able to do it, just listen to O'Brock. Last thing he always says, which is in fact ringing true in America right now, is Yes, we can. So thank you very much, folks. All right. And that's the way to get a hold of me. Wow, Peter. Let's uh, go back to Brock. Um, whatever things you're taking, if this is how jet lag works for you, right? <laughs> Sorry, uh, in from San Francisco. I mean, you should, we should adopt your approach to a Danish high school. You could finish three years of high school in 20 minutes with you as a teacher. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let, let, let's do this fast. Uh, as I, I know you want to. Uh, the floor is open for questions. In just a few seconds, I just want to ask you a few questions first. You showed this uh, My Barack Obama homepage. Yeah. Uh, I'm logged into this also. Uh, I can follow what's happening. I can uh, make a profile, I can meet friends, I can fundraise if I want that, I can put in a zip code, I, know I can find out what events is taking place just around me tonight, I can go there, 
I can see how active I am compared compared to other people. Right now, I'm 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 in a shared 482nd place, I think, yeah. within this profile, uh, this community. Uh, it's really working. Yeah. But is it really that big? I mean, you. Uh, it would be fair to say that you weren't overly critical uh, towards this uh, <laughs> phenomenon. Uh, you could argue that Barack Obama is mainly winning now because the economy is sinking and not because of technology. Without the, this economic crisis, he would probably lose. Uh, I, I would say that's not true. Uh, I, I think there is a traditional way to analyze this, and that's essentially why, essentially, the... Um, Newspaper media, pundit class in Washington, and everybody got it wrong. They basically said, oh, Hillary's absolutely going to win way early. She was anointed. No way she could lose. They've been saying constantly, kind of miscalling the, this election. Oh, young people won't vote. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And what I'm just saying is the current way to see why he's raising is just because of the economy. And that is, an, you know, that is a piece of it. But what is really deeper and more fundamental going on here is, I really believe, essentially, this ground this new fundamental uh, foundation essentially of politics and I've been calling way before this financial crisis I've been saying in fact back in the spring in fact even earlier I uh, saying that essentially what you're going to watch here is uh, the Republicans and McCain do not know what's going to hit them because a lot of the ground laying of get out the vote a lot of the ground laying of registering young voters uh, new voters in Hispanic groups uh, a lot of the kind of new technologies uh, that are actually happening are going to have this kind of kicker right at the end. It's like under the surface because people aren't watching this. They're not seeing how, you know, everyone's loading up all their social networks. They're not seeing how they're laying the groundwork to get out the vote in through social networks. And so I'm think so we'll see, but I will say it's not just the climate of politics. It is essentially the fabric of politics, the foundations of politics that's changing. And what you're going to see, I think, now again, we'll see, but I think it's going to be a very substantial mm -hmm. victory and it's going to be surprised a lot of people, not just because of the financial crisis, but because of the power of these new things that no one really realized would happen. Extremely interesting how you uh, link uh, historical paradigm shifts in politics with parad paradigmatic shifts in technology. Yeah. Uh, you could argue that the last one with television meant that, uh, that uh, ideology, political belief, actually took a lower priority vis-a-vis uh, -vis technology, 30 uh, seconds uh, uh, advertisement and so on. And now with what you're saying here, you could believe that it is going to uh, make uh, even lesser difference uh, than before because it just depends on how you master technology. Uh, not necessarily. The, the, the technology itself, there's a certain kind of politician or a certain kind of leader that would work in, different, in those two different environments. So broadcast television, there's no mistake that broadcast radio, when it came about, you had very powerful leaders like Hitler, you had Stalin, you had basically FDR, you had uh, Churchill, you had very powerful charismatic leaders, but people who could take that top-down centralized thing and really manipulate it and really do you know, wild things. What's happening with this technology is you can't control it. In fact, it's coming up from all over. You're getting all kinds of people making ads about you. you say you're getting videoed every step of the way. You're getting people in private meetings using recordings of your, I mean, there's no way you can control it. And so the fundamental danger, one, of these kind of, you know, totalitarian type folks is completely gone. But also, I think the kind of politician that can manipulate has to be in that environment is much more, has to be more transparent, has to be more open, has to roll with the punches, has to be more, in, have more integrity and kind of earnestness. And I think that's what people will respond to. They have to be more real. And so I think uh, even though this technology mastered by the right person could be very powerful, I don't think it has the same dangers inherent that you actually saw. No, no, I'm not television. talking about dangers. I'm just saying that ideology means uh, not as much as yep. before. No, absolutely. I think what you're going to do is it's going to be a much more direct connection to voters. They're going to basically, you know, you, who you are and how you lead and what your ideas are are going to make more difference than whether you're the right faction of your party and have the control of that, okay. all of your people and stuff. Right. So, yeah, ideology, is, I think, is going gonna, is gonna to fade in, okay. in the kind of its... Pressing us there. Okay. Uh, questions? This is our moment. <laughs> uh, where are the mics? Where are the mic microphones? Over Hello? here? Oh, yes. My Stand up and uh, speak loud. My name is Lars Henrik. You talked a bit about uh, Hispanic voters and Afro American voters using mobile phones. What kind of impact does that ha have on the uh, polls that are mainly? 
as far as I know, um, traditional telephones. Uh, Huge impact. Everyone heard the question? Do we have to repeat it? But the question about telephones. Absolutely. The idea that all these people are essentially on, uh, particularly young people, are on cell phones and do not have landlines. There is no way in the United States to reliably tap into that 30% of the population now that has cell phones because there's no, as you know, kind of public uh, uh, way to get it at those numbers. And so it is definitely skewing polling. And I think with time, it's going to really, really make it problematic. And that's one of the reasons I think you're watching the, the polls have been so neck and neck on the in different weeks ahead of this. They're not counting a lot of these people I've been pointing out to who are really, really charged you up. You didn't mention this new iPhone application. And yeah, he mentioned that we were chatting earlier. It's like, just take this iPhone application, which is phenomenal. It came out here just a week ago. I was actually part of the beta tester uh, on this thing. With the Obama campaign, essentially came out with an iPhone application you download. And essentially what it does is it, organize, it takes your address book on your iPhone and organizes the whole thing by battleground states, which in the United States is the critical states that essentially could tip the election, and says, hey, you've got three friends in uh, Ohio, Ohio, and you've got six business people, friends of yours in F Florida. Just hit this and call them and see what you can do. Talk to them about voting. Okay. It's an incredible tool. Okay. And again, okay. something okay. that yeah, 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 no, Now you're going too slow. Let's, okay. let's speed it up a little. Um, yes. My name is Mirde. Uh, we've heard a lot about... Um, Right here. Oh, there, sorry, there. Um, we've heard a lot about uh, Facebook supporters and my MyBo supporters during the election, uh, well, the campaign. But what about um, using Facebook friends and networks after, like, if he gets elected as president? How will he use the networks uh, as a governing tool? Absolutely great. This is exactly segues to Kata. What I'm saying is, what's happening is you're mobilizing. It's not clear, and I don't have any privy a access to this, but it's, pos I, it's possible he has something close to 10 million people on his email list, right? Uh, actively communicating every day with about at least 10 million people, possibly more, actually. Uh, now, those people aren't going to, once the election happens, just say, okay, I'm just going to turn on the TV and watch what happens for the next four years. They're going to want to say, okay, now we've won. What can I do? You know, what next? What can I do? And the same thing with the Facebook folks. They're going to say, great, they're energized. I'm really, we won. Why, 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 why do you think so? Why do you think so? Why do you think so? Because they felt so much a part of the victory and actually the politics of it. They weren't just watching TV commercials and voting once, you know, in the fall. They were actually out there convincing people and putting their money in and, and, and going out there calling people What you're up. saying is really that this is a fundamental demo democratizing of American yeah, politics. Yeah, it is a fu I do believe it's a fundamental. You really believe that? I think it's a re it's, it's energizing, uh, not, not just Not politics, just in fundraising. But, but, but de uh, democracy. And I think what you're going to see, and this is why my own, my own interest is going to the after election, I think what you're going to see is a huge number of people now want to engage Washington, want to get involved in policy making, want to get involved in pre really involved with how do we change the country, and not just in Washington, but how do we do it in local states, and how do we really go. You're wa and again, this generation, I do a whole talk on the millennial generation. It's an extraordinary generation, and one of the things about them is they're extremely civic-minded. They're very high rates of volunteerism. They really can do. They're very team oriented. They're they're, they're not individualistic. They're and very, Peter, like, and so they'll be the and, perfect kind of folks. And, and, for this like, thing. and like every other American citizen who is now 20 years old and very liberal will get 30 and 40 and more and more conservative and you know just no, fit into the good old American mold where actually, it's 60 percent Republicans against 40 percent Democrats. They just now have the technology that they didn't have before. Actually, the, it's interesting. I turned off a slide before this talk yeah. to show you. It is not true that all young people are more liberal or progressive, and as they get older, they get more conservative. In fact, what happens in generations is very clear. You essentially form your personality, essentially, when you're young, and you tend to vote consistently for the rest of your life. It, it takes a generation, about three elections, to basically lock into how they think, and then they tend to go. Now, the proof of this is that the last generation before the millennials was Generation X, they were essentially, as young people, in college and in their 20s, very conservative. They actually were voted for Ronald Reagan. They were very conservative, and they are the most conservative group right now in American politics, like more conservative than old people. And vice versa, the original GI, we call them the GI generation, essentially the generation of uh, Franklin Roosevelt's young people of that time who fought in World War II and the post-war economy. That, we call them the GI generation. That was like um, John F. Kennedy's generation. They voted for... Franklin Roosevelt, and were very progressive in the 30s and 40s, and they, to this day, they're 90 years old, and they're still voting Democrat. 
So basically, what happens is it's not just a maturing of your life cycle. It's how you crystallize your belief system early, and then you carry it through life. And so I think for that reason, I think this millennial generation is not going to basically change. It's actually going to drive a new kind of politics for the okay. next 30 years. Three questions in a row. Yes? Hello. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, as I see, it's all about funding right now, and uh, using the web uh, obviously makes it global. Um, and my question is, uh, is it possible for non-Americans to, uh, to contribute, and uh, do you have any numbers on uh, non-American contributions, Democrats versus Republicans? Oh, did you wait, wait, no, a new question? Yeah? Do you want to answer? Oh, the, yeah, after, we'll take Sorry. this a few questions first. Yeah? yeah? Um, I'm, I'm from Canada, and uh, we also have an election in Canada. And uh, really? The, yes. <laughs> we have our own whole system and everything. Oh. Um, but uh, one of the things that's happening in Canada is we have a minority right of center government, and the left is split. And uh, so the, the, the right government uh, cut the arts funding, and so a bunch of local artists got really pissed off about this and decided to do something about it. And so they built an application that you can uh, use online which would, you enter your zip code, your postal code, and it tells you how to vote strategically. Oh. So people are transcending ideological differences and they're voting for the Green Party or the Democrats depending on where they live. So it's, it's interesting how these things become action-oriented. You can actually affect your voting. Interesting. Yeah, another one? No? Okay. Okay. So just, uh, well, yeah. just the, quick, the quick answer to this is you actually can't legally uh, from abroad, uh, donate uh, literal money to, to, to the Obama campaign or to that. You can actually, uh, I think, donate to places like uh, Move On and some of these um, uh, groups outside of the country. Uh, but you cannot do it in political, act, uh, political um, candidates. That said, is you can do a lot of other things. And you can get involved in many respects. And um, I'll just, uh, anyhow, there, there, there's, there's a bunch of ways that you can throw your voice in, you know, help organize, you can send emails, you can, you know, help push the ball. And frankly, with Skype and other things, you can probably make phone calls for that matter and say, hey, I'm setting somebody in Denmark here and it's important to us that, you know, you at least consider, you know, whoever you're going to vote for, hopefully uh, Obama. Uh, anyhow, there, there is a way to do that. And I actually think it matters. I, I think particularly with this younger generation, very global generation, I'll just mention to this, um, 20% of American college students now are spending some time abroad as part of their four-year uh, college experience. Uh, so it's a, it's a generation that's getting much more, uh, their attitude towards the world is much more open, and, and the, how the world thinks is very, very important, not just to them, but I think to a lot of Americans. And so I think the global opinion is uh, an important factor, uh, although it's not the critical piece, it's, it certainly would help. And in terms of the other thing, I think absolutely, what, what I'm saying here, you know, again, I'm from America, I'm kind of watching this from the American's point of view. But clearly, this is a paradigm that's being cracked globally. This is, these things could work in almost any, certainly, Western democracy kind of uh, situation. Uh, it is being used. There's some terrific stuff happening in Canada, as you mentioned. But also, uh, Europe's got some really neat uh, examples of this, too. And I think, basically, what you're watching here is you're going to see this thing just proliferate. For, for one thing, nobody in American politics will not do politics the way Obama's kind of done going forward in terms of presidential politics. The message is clear. This is something you've got to start doing. And I think globally, you're going to see the same thing happening. You're going to see uh, whoever the kind of leading edge and tech-oriented kind of right. folks in, in Europe uh, or any place are going to also um, get uh, confidence at the very least, but also a wave of enthusiasm to start really doing this stuff. Uh, and again, there's some things we can learn across borders. It's, there's neat stuff going on all over the world, uh, but definitely worth tuning into right now in uh, the States. And I don't know, are we, do we have time, or we, I guess we could want to finish it up here. But, uh, no, 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 we have uh, a little time. Because I don't want to keep sure people from could, lunch. Uh, we have it's a little almost time. noon here. And, uh, huh? uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you can, you can, you can I'm answer. I'm certainly happy to stay here all day, and I can sit here and talk afterwards, too. Okay, yes. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is John Lund. I'm from IB Denmark, for the Danske Interactive Media. I have one question. Uh, Obama himself, how personally is he involved in the campaign online? Is he maintaining his social profile actively, blocking uh, status updates, etc.? Very good question. Uh, I will say I'm not part of the campaign, and you know, so I, I don't want to speak for the campaign. I will say this, but from my uh, one thing, I can say he is a very tech savvy himself. He's a BlackBerry addict. He's constantly on the BlackBerry, uh, constantly mm -hmm. working with yeah. it. He. Uh, 
for those that are interested, frankly, he gave a phenomenal talk at Google in November of 2007, at the really, actually October, November of, of the fall of 2007, in which he articulated his own technology and innovation platform, but also kind of you could see his real appreciation and understanding of technology. If you really want to see that, actually, you can go to the, actually, there's a site called Tech for Obama. It's a very new site just launched here. I had a little bit to do with it, but basically, um, Tech for Obama. Uh, dot com. And if you go there, actually that video, among others, is right there. Um, or you can go through YouTube and get it. But what it shows is this is not a guy who's just his handlers or his campaign managers telling him to do this kind of stuff. He uh, gets it. He's a community organizer from a long time. He understands bottom up. He understands it's not about him. It's about everybody and getting given the tools to actually work. Uh, and in terms of the literal side of uh, the Twittering and things like that, my basic feeling, not knowing for sure, is it's just given all the demands on him and stuff, I don't think he's literally doing his own Twitter feeds or his uh, uh, various updates. But uh, he's very much involved in uh, the framing and how that works. And occasionally, I'm sure he jumps on there, too, just, uh, just to okay. play it once in a while. All right. Yeah, last question. Um, well, I'm, I'm a bit disillusioned right now because I think it sounds as if structures are more important than ideology and everything else. And basically, I can't help thinking this is the first time that somebody is using social technology uh, in an election. But what about next time? Do we just roll over and say, well, demography shows that this is what the kind of result we're going to have, depending on the population at that time? No, no. Well, two things you think I think you're saying there, if I hear you right, is uh, the tools themselves, I would say, uh, although the strategic advantage right now with Obama and the Democrats, within the next cycle, I would say, if certainly in the next couple cycles, it'll essentially be a ubiquitous tool, ubiquitous approach. The model will have been cracked. And no matter who's, what your ideology is, whatever, you'll be able to kind of use these things. The, the great example is this happened with uh, broadcast television in 1960. You watched it, the innovation, the explosion of innovation around television and politics from 60, 64, to maybe about 66, it was essentially reinvented politics around television with John F. Kennedy and the 30-second ad and various things like that. By 1968, the guy who had run against Kennedy and got beat, Richard Nixon, partly because he didn't know how to present himself on television and with the, in the debates and others, by 68, he won because he hired Madison Avenue and was able to just use television to his advantage. And so the point is, uh, there's no structural advantage for any one particular ideology or for that matter candidate in the long term. It's just that whoever figures it out early is going to have strategic advantage and that's Obama and the Democrats for right now. That's one piece. The other piece is I'm, I, don't, I want to make clear here, even though this uh, generational change and, and immigrant change is a very you know, um, big force in American politics, it's still by no means the overwhelming population. And also, you know, even though there's 60 percent of these folks might be voting Democratic, 40 percent don't. And, you know, you can be influenced by your ideas and, you know, persuasive arguments or if the Democrats don't perform or Obama betrays them. I mean, you know, people will shift. So I don't want to get too deterministic. But I will say uh, if in the general trending and the general analysis of what's happening in America, you would have to take into account these meta trends of population and how are they thinking. Because you're going to have a close to not half, but it'll be a very big uh, percentage of the American population are going to be a part of these two groups. There is overlap, by the way, too, because this, uh, immigrants, Hispanics in particular, are quite young, so there's a kind of a crossover there. So it's not two separate groups; they're kind of merged groups at some level. So anyhow, big okay. deal, not determined. Okay, and just, I think we just, gotta go. just lastly, oh. um, you know, coming from the old world, one can help being a little bit, you know, skeptical about. Uh, going into an Obama office where there is a big picture of him with, uh, with a, this glow of light around his head, the quote of the day, yes, we can, and so <laughs> on. It seems like, uh, to a guy like me, it's as, as fantastic, amazing, interesting, but also as a kind of uh, secular religion, which, which is particularly American. Uh, if you were here in the 60s, you would be talking about television, and you would say that this is a fundamental change. It will democratize the way we talk about politics and so on, and you could argue that that was true, partly, but you, looking back, you could also argue that it would have some quite destructive uh, consequences on, on, on democracy. If you should point at just one critical uh, point uh, that this could lead to something not so desirable, what would that be? Oh. Very good point here, I would say. Here, there's a, there are several 
problems with this technology. I don't, I don't want to be too Pollyannish. In a short period, though, to make an argument, I basically pulled all the, the positive things. Mm. The thing that's going to be very hard for Obama, for anybody, is that to solve these challenges, to really take on climate change, for example, is going to take some initially unpopular positions. So, for example, we're probably, I would say, we're probably going to have to entertain something like a carbon tax to reshift the orientation, the incentives of the entire economy away from carbon-based fuel and to renewable fuel, which is, from a policy point of view, makes total sense. From a political point of view, it is very difficult to do. And so what's happening is, given the transparency and given everyone watching and given everyone's voice in this process, it's going to be hard maybe to take the big leaps and, uh, without profound leadership and you know, really learning and teaching to move people along. And I'm fearing that these tools will essentially, could potentially paralyze uh, a leader who has to make some unpopular but necessary decisions uh, about how the country might have to go and won't be able to convince everyone because these same tools are empowering everyone to kind of bring it down, you know, kind of counter it uh, and raise hell, basically, because uh, you're betraying us or something. So it is a, it, it, by no means is this figured out. We're just beginning the journey into these new politics and the new government of this kind of tools. Uh, but by far, I would say it's uh, generally a positive development, and it's one that I think bodes well for the future. Okay. And uh, love to stay connected to all you folks. And... Uh, you can always contact me or afterwards, but also uh, ping me. Are you on uh, the internet? <laughs> I am on the internet. Uh, and uh, <laughs> linked uh, Facebook and All LinkedIn, right. the whole thing. Pete it, it could also stop politicians from making stupid decisions, and that would be quite an advantage. True. Thank you true, very true, true. much for coming and sharing. It's been amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.